In this video, I'm going to be going through the 2020 HSC exam for engineering studies. Um, I have actually written out the answers for some of these so that we have some um, images and calculations ready to go. I won't read out the question. Um, I assume that you can read the question, but I will just try and give the answer in sort of sentence format. So the reason why we use polymers um, to cover copper cables is to provide insulation. Um, what is the main purpose applying yet to insulate it? Okay, um, I, I will just say for the first six questions, they were all answered pretty well. Um, seven, question seven is the first one where we have um, not, it's not answered as well. And then question eight is a doozy. So um, less than half of the people get it. So let's have a look. Um, why do we have flaps? Okay. <clears throat> So flaps are there to increase lift at lower speeds for takeoff and landing. Uh, we talked about the Saab has canards, and the purpose of canards is um, to improve short takeoff and landing. And we also talked about, so um, is it, I think, the F-14s in uh, Top Gun that they fly at the end, that they have um, swept wings, that they those movable wings are to increase lift at low speeds, so at takeoff and landing. Um, but the reason why we like canards better is because they don't have movable parts. That's a big long answer that you know you didn't need, but um, sometimes I you know, try and add value. Okay, which is the best for making um, complex polymers? Well, generally, if in doubt, for um, polymers we want to use injection molding. Okay, so um, the diagram shows a model of a windmill which is designed to lift a mass of a turbine. Okay, so I, um, I've i actually got answers for this. So what we've got is work equals Fs, and um, so we're saying force equals, so the F is for force, and that's equal to mass times gravity. So that's going to be 0.8. I'll just zoom out. This is in a little too big. Um, just check all of that even on the screen, it should be on the screen. Um, yeah, it's on the screen. Okay, um, so F equals mg, and so the mass, it's important that we use 0.08. A lot of the time people will say, see 80 grams, and they'll write 0.8. That's very common. Also, if you do chemistry, really pay attention to that. I'm multiplying by 10. Um, it's close enough to 9.8 that we're allowed to use that in the HSC. Uh, which is specifically the case for their answers. And then for displacement, that is 0.2. Um, so remember to convert to meters. And that will give us uh, 0.16, I think, is what we got for four. Um, yep, okay. So um, moving on, so what, can I pan? Okay, this will be better. Uh, what? services oh okay now this one here question five i didn't like this but most people seem to get it um okay so yep they've said um engineering um, public health and safety i guess the idea i mean the thing i try to say to to students is it's one of those things where if you have a um serious health accident on site you will not finish on time you will not be efficient and you will probably get sued so I always like to think about, I mean, this is more a thing that when you do design technology that you see, um, when we have answers that, you know, when one answer, when D contains B, then D is the right answer. So in the, this case, B contains all of them. You will not be on your time if you have um, health and safety issues. You will not be um, efficient if you have health and safety issues. So this is why when we talk about typically the things we care about is um, delivering projects on time and um, under budget. But you can't do those things if you are if you have a, a loss of time injury, it's going to really slow down your production. And just ethically, um, it's important. Okay, so potentiometers are the dials that we use. Um, for those of you who have worked with Arduinos, uh, we have free tronic shields and those free tronic shields have um, potentiometers and we use those to um, turn on off and on the, the flashing rates. Um, I do actually have some notes I showed where we can see that. That is in the textbook. Which textbook is it in? It's in the year 11 textbook. I did have the year 11 textbook open previously. I'm just going to pause the record. Okay, and we're back. Um, so potentiometer, a variable resistor, by sliding or rotating a control, the resistance may be increased or decreased. So I guess if you're thinking about like um, 
music producers, audio engineers, they um, they sl they have sliders rather than dials, but typically we think of like volume knobs and those sorts of things. They're potentiometers. Um, I'll just quickly ref show what I was referring to with the Arduinos. So we use thinker shields. I think that's two words. It is. So this dial here is the potentiometer. Um, and you do a lesson called Pot Basics. P O T is for potentiometer. Um, and if we do. It's shown as a variable resistor. So a resistor with an arrow pointing to it is how we show a, um, or a, a, an arrow across it like that is how we can show a potentiometer. Okay, um, and let's get back into it. So um, the next thing is, uh, ooh, okay, so seven, yeah, this one wasn't answered that well. The answer is C. Um, an unpowered aircraft, uh, aircraft will glide in a controlled descent when the lift to ratio, um, lift to drag, lift to drag ratio is high. We're going to get long distance um, at a shallow glide angle. Um, why did the Romans build these arches? Okay, so cutting to the chase, the answer is C. Um, and the problem is that people will look at that and say, well, that's not a very long distance. But it's all relative. Um, it's not long compared to, say, the Golden Gate Bridge or the Akashi Kaiko Bridge or all those sorts of things. But um, I guess the question is, well, they weren't particularly easy to construct. They weren't particularly fast to construct. And they certainly don't place the foundation's intention. So with all of those things considered, um, we get to um, spanning long distances. It's all relative, I guess, is the point. So it's true to say, well, are they easy to construct relative to other things? No, I mean, compared to timber, um, you know, timber would be easier to construct. Um, timber would probably be faster to construct, but timber would not be able to span that those those sorts of lengths. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to pan. That's how we're going to do this. Okay, um, so we're going to test some concrete uh, using a compressive test. So if we go to my mate Sam Rockwell and my testing mega thread. Um, I've got compressive test. If we click on that, we get to here and we can um, see this lab test. Well, that was already fully, already made a big. Um, and when this cracks, uh, crash, uh, cracks when uh, we don't actually see what we consider to be an hourglass fracture from this angle, but we have um, got this in the textbook and I've actually got this ready. So this is from, um, oh, actually, no, this is from Google Classroom. So it's in concrete testing and we've got hourglass failure looks like this. Uh, we can also get conical failure, but it's just sort of an hourglass without the top. And I've got the link to that video and we've got, these are the samples when, before we test them. We um, make those samples by putting them in this container and uh, here we have Copeland talking about hourglass fracture. Um, so that's from the previous book. That's from the year 11 textbook. And I do actually have this very question in, um, in our notes. So uh, the answer is going to be yeah, the hourglass fracture. If we just go back to um, the book, the A is the one that looks closest to an hourglass. Okay. Um, which of the following contains... Uh, is, is, yeah. Yeah, it contains tasks performed by an aeronautical engineer. Okay, so I looked at this by um, by elimination. So we don't, air traffic is not an aeronaut, aeronautical engineer's jo job. Scheduling flights is not an aeronautical engineer's job. And public relations, oh, no air traffic, that's the one. That, I mean, I would argue there is some element of public relations, but air traffic is not part. So. Based on those elimination, we're going to say A is the answer. Okay, for 11, I have drawn um, this diagram. I did it to scale. Uh, you could do it analytically. I didn't care to do it um, mathematically, but it will be the same sort of concept. So let me just get the drawing. And um, I wonder if I can, if there's a tool to pan. If I hit P. Yeah, okay, like that. 
Okay, um, so I just drew it of this little diagram here, and you might think, well, if I draw it in this little diagram, my, my um, numbers might be off. I measured this value, and um, so I, I just drew the triangle. I moved the, so if you don't do physics, this might be, um, this sort of addi um, vector addition might be something that we haven't done for a long time. But the idea is I've just brought this force down and I've made them made sure that they go in a clockwise direction. So they either need to be all clockwise or all anti-clockwise. So if we're saying this is, uh, if we take these three forces, we've got a force down, we've got a force up to the left and an up to the right. We've got a force down, up to the left and up to the right. And see how all the arrows go go clockwise. Doesn't matter if they go clockwise or anti-clockwise. They just all have to go in the same direction, um, unless we're finding a resultant. If we're finding a resultant, we measure from the start to the finish. Okay, so then I know the um, the weight, which I've written as mg. They've told us the mass is ten, and I'm assuming that this is on Earth, right? That's a reasonable assumption. So I've then said multiplied that by ten. So I've got a hundred. And um, so I just measured that down. I said, well. If that's 100, it was 18 millimeters, right? If that was 100, the side that represents A, which is this side here, I got a 16 millimeters. So I need, know it needs to be a little bit smaller than 100. So straight away, it's 18, right? But when I um, do my scale, I get um, 88.9. It's pretty close. When I did it in this scale, I didn't get, my numbers weren't as good because even though it was bigger, the problem is that my um, angles weren't perfect. I, I transferred them across. I was a little bit lazy. I didn't use two set squares. I just, you know, eyeballed it. So um, there is a risk there. But that said, it's still close enough that I, I there's no other answer that you know, even 92. There's nothing else that's close to 92. So it's pretty easy. Okay, so we're now onto satellites. Um, now I think this is a relatively oh relatively tough question. Um, so I think I have something about uh, satellites. Mm, I may have closed it. Um, we'll go to concrete because we don't need that anymore. And uh, telco and satellites, and we have geosynchronous satellites. They're in a position. Uh, they're in a fixed position, rotating with the Earth. So that's what's going on there. So if it rotates with the Earth, well, the Earth rotates around this, the axis once. Um, so you could think about it as being like the satellite might be directly above Sydney, or the satellite might be directly above, um, well, actually, they, they're usually on the equator. So let's say directly above Singapore, or directly above Nauru, or wherever it's going to be on the equator, um, Quito, which is on the equator, and um, in Netrunner. Um, New Angeles is on the equator because if you want to have a space elevator, you want to put down the, the equator. Um, so yeah, it's going to rotate once. I think it's pretty tough because someone might say, well, it's t rotating zero times relative to Quito or you know wherever the place is on the equator. But um, yeah, the answer is one. He said confidently without checking. Yep, okay, it was big. Uh, yeah, I mean, nothing here has been as bad as the Roman question so far. That, that was 50-50, so some, half the people got it, half the people didn't. Okay, um, for this question here, I don't dislike this question. It is um, a little bit more complicated, I'll give you that. Um, I talk about how there are four kinds of sliding questions. There's boring, boring sliding, which is just when it's on a flat surface. There's bears, which are when we have P at an angle. There are boats when we have this surface um, at an angle. And then we have bull questions. And I call this a bull question because uh, it's both sliding and the force P is at an angle. Now I talk about how, although they love to have these on the independent trials, we don't really see calculations, like extensive calculations using these sorts of questions. But um, that said, if we just use our forces, um, I'll, oh, I've skipped a question. Sorry, um, I skipped, make sure you always check, say every five questions, make sure you're always using the right number. That's how you avoid um, disasters like that. Um, microwaves, sorry, not microwaves. Um, how do we transmit uh, stuff down fiber optic cable? Well, we use a narrow spectrum of light. We usually use laser diodes. Um, so I've got a wavelength of um, 1500 nanometers or 190 terahertz. 
And the reason we do that is because it reduces absorption um, and scattering. And I got that from this, so, uh, this here. So that puts us in the infrared zone. And that gets us back to paper. Okay, um, so yeah, we're looking for this angle. So what I've said here, and I'll zoom in. Maybe back one. Okay, so what we've said here is that um, if we're breaking weight into its component forces, I've created um, my own reference system. So this is something you can do. This is something you do in CAD sometimes too. Um, I've got my own reference system. So I've rotated the uh, my X and Y axis to match the slope. And what I've done is I've said W, I've broken it down into its two components, WX and WY. And rather than using WX and WY, probably better to, is, is to refer to it as the one that's adjacent to the angle that, um, so this angle here will be the same thing here, right? That, that angle there will be the same. So the one that is rotated here will be, um, so this is adjacent, so that's gonna be, because it's adjacent, we get um, cos theta. So we're gonna get, did I, did I write that in somewhere? Oh yeah, here we go, W cos theta, nice. And I wrote the wrong angle there. I wrote phi. It, it should actually be um, theta. It should be phi. You're just going to have to forgive me there. And for P, we're going to break P down. So we've got P, X, and P, Y. Um, in the case of P, we're using the opposite. So we're using sine. So that's why we get P sine theta is the value, uh, value there. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take the sum of the forces in the Y direction. So if we have... Um, the only one that is going down is going to be, I wish I'd drawn some arrows there. I did draw arrows here, but I just didn't draw them on the thing. Um, w, w cos theta is going down. N is pushing up. P sine theta is pushing up. Now, so for me, that would be enough, but just to make it really clear. So what I've said is, um, so some, some of the moments in the Y direction equals zero. So zero equals, now N is positive because it's in the direction of our arrow and plus p sine theta because it's in that same direction minus w cos theta because it's opposite the direction so it's in minus and then when i use my algebra and i bring these over i get um w cos theta minus so that will give me oh um i circled c was that right yeah i've circled the wrong thing i feel like an idiot now but this is what I've written. Um, yeah. um, w cos minus P sine. Um, hey, I uh, was doing this as overtime, so you're going to have to forgive that circling of the wrong one. I don't know why I did that. Um, it's like, because I wrote it, and I was like, I'm not an idiot. I'm really not, but I'm not an idiot, but you know, I guess that everyone makes mistakes. Okay. So what we're looking at now with the next one is a uniformly distributed load on a simply supported beam. Now these circles, they represent a UDL and they represent lots of little um, down arrows. You could think of it as just being like that half a circle and you know, half a circle each side represents a down arrow. And they're just drawing so many down arrows that it's just easier just to draw these, um, these curves. And that's very much the, the convention in industry. Everyone draws them that way. Not everyone, but almost everyone. Sometimes you do see them actually just drawn as lots of little arrows. Anyway, um, so what we're looking for a shear force diagram. I always thought, think of a shear force diagram as being a pretty simple story. For once upon a time we had a beam, we get, went up an, uh, an amount, and then we went, in this case, a UDL. So we're gonna have a little tiny bit down, 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 a little bit of tiny bit down, and then one big bit up. So it's gonna be A. Which of the following um, contributes to pit or crevice corrosion in aircraft component joints? Okay, um, I'm gonna come back to this guy in a second, um, but I don't wanna waste any time, but I think he has, uh, he's recently put some up, some, uh, he's got even more stuff on precipitation hardening, good work. Um, yeah, he's, good job. Um, okay, so somewhere he has stuff on um, pit and crevice corrosion, um, and I put that in our Google Classroom. Uh, but, sorry, um, 
Yeah, oxygen concentration. We also call these concentration cells. So yeah, it's a concentration of um, oxygen, not a concentration of alloys. Um, okay, so the next question, we've got a true length question. Now, I always find these ones hard to put in, um, like I can't put these on Google Classroom because you, you really need to do these on the paper to scale them. So uh, I have got the answers here, but um, for this part of the paper, it's not all that useful. Um, we're looking at my answers and okay. So the first thing we need to do is we need to say that this, um, the value they've given us is the staunchion is 6.5 and the staunchion is measured from D to C. So D to C. And when I measured D to C, I think it was actually 55 millimeters, right? It was drawn at a, um, a scale of 100 to 1. Um, and then what I'm going to do is because BD is not a true length, what I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate it along until it becomes a true length. And then once I've got a true length, I'm going to bring that horizontal value across. And then it's just going to make my BD a little bit longer. Now, I've said before that if you're really you know, caught um, with true length and things like that, what I would say is just think about it in terms of we know the true length is the hypotenuse. And the hypotenuse has to be bigger than the two values. So if you just take the, if you look at BD in both views and you add a little bit, you probably won't be that far off, right? And so just if we're looking at the values, if we measure off and say, oh, well, 73, well, we know it has to be a little bit bigger. That would be the idea. Um, but, oh, and sorry, yeah. I, I, sorry, when I said um, CD was a true length, it's a true length in this view, which I've written in here. But, um, the reason why it's a true length in this view is because it's perpendicular to the viewer in this, this view. So the idea is that um, when we're looking at CD here, it is as close to my, eye, uh, my eyes at D as it is to C. And the reason I know that is because in this view, it's not, it's not moving away from me. Uh, I can see the perpendicular line here tells me that it's a true length in this view. Um, okay. Whereas that's not the case for for um, for DB. So in both of these views, it's moving either closer or um, further away or closer to us. Okay. So we need to rotate it, and that gives us the true length. Okay. So here we have precipitation hardening, and well, who would I go to for precipitation hardening? Is um, we were just there. So we've got aging, over aging. Um, that's what this teacher did professionally before he became a teacher. He was a metallurgist. So, um, I mean, I guess that's why he's got so many things on um, precipitation hardening. My, I, I don't know how much precipitation hardening you really need in your life. Um, I wonder if he's taken down the old ones. That would be interesting. It's possible. Um, Real engineering has stuff on precipitation hardening too. So um, I think if we look on my aluminum notes, you know, this one's probably going to be a longer video. So uh, let's go to um, aero and we're going to go to materials. Hmm. Where's my aero materials? Oh, it's in post trial because I didn't test um, aeronautical materials. Um, okay, so here I'm pretty sure I have precipitation hardening in here somewhere. No, we might have done it in back in transport. Transport materials, okay. Aluminium, and here we got all of this stuff on precipitation hardening. So we've got Oregon Tech. There we go, we do still have the video um, on precipitation hardening, more on precipitation hardening. 
and um, real engineering talks about precipitation hardening. Okay, so um, let's keep going. So I will give, I mean, precipitation is what we're looking at, but I'll give a quick brief description of what's going on. So um, if we say have um, 2000 series uh, aluminium, so Drew aluminium is an example of this, 2000, um, 2017, or these days it'd be 2024 is what you'd use. Um, it's a copper-based aluminium alloy, so it's got you know, a, a fairly reasonable amount of copper. And what happens is that the copper ordinarily will form um, little phases of, uh, well, aluminium with high amounts of copper. And what we want to do is we want to actually have the copper fairly evenly distributed through the, um, through the grains. But we don't want it perfectly distributed. Uh, I guess, you know what, we will actually open up these videos and we'll go back to that one on um, real engineering. That's probably the best description, I think. And that was the one we just looked at. Okay, so what he's going to say is here that when we have, um, what we want to do is when we have metal crystals, what we want to do is we want to create disruptions to the lattice because if we have disruptions in the lattice, it's harder for dislocations to get pushed around. And what we want to do is we're going to replace some aluminium with copper. And copper is just a little bit bigger than um, aluminium, or I, I'm going to say that that's the case. And we can see that that disrupts the, the lattice a little bit. But what we want to do instead is we want to, that would be our alpha phase. If we just had everything perfectly distributed. But when we age harden, what will happen is that we will get a clump of six or you know a small number of microscopic um, collections of copper meeting in the middle and that will create a much more significant disruption to the lattice and so it will make it harder to push um, those dislocations around okay so I mean that's my short version um, you know the this guy here wherever he was um, he will give a much better answer than I will because you know, he's a metallurgist and you know we all play to our strengths okay turbo fans generally more fuel efficient than turbojet engines why is that because of the bypass so high bypass to the combustion system yeah I think that's right yep oh um just quickly pointing out that um yeah so yeah people didn't get the bypass i'm surprised i have my video um i'll just quickly go back and uh, talk about so 15 was not answered well there you go i'm surprised i i, I though i my one of my things is bending because that was something i did as part of my work so i really stress bending i was a big part of my degree um pit and crevice corrosion yeah I, i'm surprised at that as well that that was answered badly. Um, I mean, this 15, you know, I sometimes talk about how if you got a puppy to just press a button at random, it would have done better than the uh, the cohort um, or pretty close to. Um, 16 was not answered very well. 17, yeah, this was not answered well at all. So there you go. Um, the puppy would have done better on that one. 18, um, people got. Um, or some number of people got about 50 50 19 yeah people did not get um, I so if I, I will quickly go to that one and say if we go back to aeronautical I have uh, lift thrust no not calculations um, propulsion so in propulsion I have some different things but I have hopefully this is the video a leap into the unknown yeah, I love this video. So watch this one. I think it gives a pretty good description. But you know, look at how all these videos of you know how jet engines work. Um, so uh, twenty. Which of the following describes high frequency wireless transmission? Okay, so higher the frequency, the more data we can send, but it tends not to go very far, right? So um, I always use the example of Wi-Fi. We say that we have 5G and uh, sorry, not 5G. We have 5 gigahertz and 2.4 gigahertz. Um, in our house, it's duck and chicken and bat cave. Bat cave is the fast one. It makes sense to me because he made a joke about people who are in a hurry, the Russians, and duck and chicken. They fly a long way. So the idea is that our five five gigahertz is Batman because it goes fast, but it doesn't go a very long way. 2.4 goes into the kids' rooms that are further away from the router. But they don't have they're not quite as fast um, okay 
So that's our multiple choice. Let's get cracking on the rest of the questions. Now for these, I have written out sort of just um, guidelines for some of them. I've actually even wrote out a few fully written answers just to sort of show how I would approach it um, using the cube method and all that sort of stuff. So here we have um, outline how one telecommunications innovation has influenced traditional voice communication. So if we're using cube, so we're circling the word outline. So outline is, um, it's really vague. What is outline? Um, man, I can't remember outline. Well, let's, let's show where they come from. Um, I will go to HSC keywords and then go to outline. Outline sketch in general terms, indicate the main features of. Okay, so um, we'll go back to here. And we'll also get this up as well. Okay, so what they said is, really, Am I, I'm, I'm on the wrong paper. Yeah, I'm on the 29. Um, okay, just one second, sorry about the people. Um, there we go. Sorry, I should have paused before I did that. Um, Okay, so it says telecommunications um, supported IT, voice communication, smartphones, replacing landlines. Yep, that's pretty good. Uh, video conferencing, great one. Um, and the way information is researched, right? So we no longer tell kids to ride down to the library with, like, like I did when I was a kid. We would also talk about cloud storage, cyber security, um, voice over IP, right? So some pretty comprehensive answers there. Um, what did I write? I said long distance phone calls. So I, um, when I've lived overseas, um, I would call home on Skype and it was, if I had moved overseas prior to that, um, once upon a time, long distance phone calls were very expensive. Whereas by the time I'd moved overseas, I could call people on Skype and I could talk for hours and hours for free because it didn't cost anything as long as you were calling from Skype to Skype. These days, I don't know if people use Skype. I mean, we do. These days, we probably use like WhatsApp or Discord or a whole bunch of different ways. I, um, over the course of last year, I decided to learn a language and I did all my lessons online. I used to get accordion lessons online, and I'm talking to people literally on the other side of the planet, and with no lag because of the the information is being transmitted at the speed of light over um, optical fiber. So um, that's that was the one I thought was pretty cool. Uh, next, we're going to look at this um, question. I have things to say about this one. So is some logic gates. So what I've done here is the thing that I think people might miss is that inputs A and D are set to high. So that would be the tricky part of this question. They're not trying to trick you, but that's where I think the trick of the question is. And so then there's only four combinations that we can have. Zero, zero. 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, and 1, 1. I tried to match the HSC answers so that you can see where that comes from. A lot of students were confused. So I always try to do the paper. Um, I get the paper an hour before the end and um, we're allowed, teachers are allowed to get the paper. And I try to do as much of the paper as I can in that hour to talk to students at the end and you know, try and give them feedback uh, if I can. And um, you know, sometimes I, they're not interested. Sometimes uh, they, they need to go straight, straight away. But so what I've done is I've set one and one, and then I've just set the values of zero and the values of C. So we've got zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, one. And this is an AND gate. So an AND gate says, well, in the case of the zeros, they're gonna be off, and the case of the ones are gonna be on. So it's zero, zero, one, one, right? It's exactly the same. On the case of the OR gate, they're all gonna be on. Why? Because as long as D is on, they're all gonna be on. And then what happens is these two values are gonna carry over. So that's exactly the same number just being moved forward. That's exactly the same number being moved forward. And what I do is when I have an, a not dot, I just ignore the not dot for a second. So I say, well, that's an or, and I didn't write the word nor there, but um, what we're just gonna treat as an or. And we said, well, if there's one, if one person's name was on the list, everyone is getting in. So they're in, 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 in. 
But then the not dot is the crazy manager who says, I don't care if you're on the list, and then not, 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 not. And that's where we get all the zeros. Now, um, just to say that, you know, sometimes people, I, I occasionally have some sort of typos in the test. Just remember that even the HSC does silly things. Um, the HSC had hoped that they had planned on doing something else and they didn't. So it's worth noting that um, they were planning on making a more interesting question. So sometimes if a question seems odd, it might just be because of a the markers, you know, just thinking differently. Uh, sorry, or, you know, something not being picked up. And I just wrote all. I could have written so, you know, in this scenario, the, the switch is always going to be on. Um, that would be the answer. Okay, supported by the truth table. Okay, so this question here is, I don't want to say it's tough, but um, there are a couple of interesting things here. So um, I will get my answers up. It's they're exactly the same, um, or pretty well exactly the same. The difference is, you know, I just wanted to, I think it's easy to see the handwritten answers rather than the typed ones is kind of why I did it this way. So what they're saying is um, the angle, it's in third angle projection. Right, that's what we normally do. The scale, the number two to one, it tells us here scale is two to one. Um, it even says the word scale. So they're, they're setting us up to help make it easier for us. Um, feature 10 is, where's is that? That's this line here, the dashed line is hidden detail. Typically we don't have hidden detail and sectioning in the same drawings, but um, at least they're not in the same view. So, you know, they're in different views. Um, Feature five is this line here. Now, if you wrote center line, I personally would give that right. And I'm, I think the HSE would probably give that right. Now in the 2018 paper, they asked, what is this line? And I just talked to a student today because we're doing some past papers in class. And um, this thickened line here and here indicates that it's a center line. Now, I, I must say when I did that paper, I was doing it in class and I made a big thing about how, you know, if you've only listened to me at one point, you know, you should know this and, Boy, what did I hit, have to hit the shame bell when I um, when I got that one wrong? Um, so this thickening is a section line, so or also called a cutting plane. Um, they wrote cutting plane in their answers. Um, yeah, section or cutting plane. Um, I just thought I would, you know, I I would have called it the section line. Okay, the correct name for view two is a section AA or. If you had written, I, I, I mean, I admit, I was looking at the answer at that point. If you wrote um, sectional front view, I would, I would pay that. So I didn't write that down, but I think that that's totally reasonable, and I think that they would have paid um, sectional front view. So um, now this one here, seven. Did you get seven? Is a counterbore, because that's what's shown here. The idea is that the counterbore is there so that it can hold the hex, the, the hex, um, the head of the bolt. So the head of the bolt's not sticking out. They will cut a little bit bigger so that way the head of the bolt sits recessed in. Yep. Okay. Um, and then view two is the detail missing in view two is the center line. Oh yeah, there's a d detail missing there. There's a center line missing. And um, also the, there's a center line missing here in, um, in view three as well. But... Yeah, I mean, I, I could see that you could stare at that for a while and before you found out that there was something missing. So I wouldn't feel too bad if you got that part wrong. Feature six says, so this, they're just pointing to this part here. So I would say it's the cut section, right? So it's showing that this indicates material that's being cut through or the term hatching. So they refer to it as um, yeah, section or, or cross hatching. Um, view three is an auxiliary view. And that's where you're giving a view rather than being a side view, um, they've just rotated. It's any any additional view. So where have we seen um, these sorts of things? I'll just quickly pause and I'll get some, I'll get a note that we can look at. So uh, the Australian Standard does talk about auxiliary views and this is where we have aligned and auxiliary um, aligned section views. So we do discuss it, but I mean, I could see that if you didn't write auxiliary view, you're certainly not alone, I think. Um, so we'll go back to the answers and the question. Um, the fillet curve is indicated by number eight. 
The detail missing. In, oh, okay, it is missing in both. Good. Okay, I I, I had a feeling. I, I did this a while ago. Um, feature four indicates that it's a hole that's been drilled through and is threaded. So we can see the thread here, and we can see the thread here. Now, just something that I was doing work with year eight, and I noticed that one of my older videos was wrong. Um, that I well, I mean the HSC was their answer sample answer was incomplete as well. But if you have a hole that is threaded, um, it will be shown like this. So a female, a female hole, a female thread with nothing in it will have the sectioning go into it. A bolt will be shown in white. And if you have a male in female, then it's white. Okay, I can see a confused look. So I'm just gonna quickly go back to um, my notes on that. If we look at Copeland, so we see here we have a female through hole who we have a blind hole. And so we can see that line coming in to here, but where the bolt is in thread, can you see how it's white? Right, so it's showing um, a bolt in thread. Yep. Okay, and if we just show just straight, uh, straight up bolt like this, we can see bolt are always just shown as white. Right, so it's only if we have a threaded hole. And so here's the standard for counter bores. Um, there have been questions where I talked about that notation. I find that notation relatively um, intuitive, but the idea is that it's saying it's 15 mil diameter, counter bore, and then the counter bore is th um, 30 millimeters wide, and then it's 15 millimeters deep. This here is saying the 90 degrees, what it's saying is it's 30, degrees, uh, 30 millimeters here, and 90 degrees means that if you draw those two lines together, that that is 90 degrees. It's important to note that the average drill is actually 120 degrees. So that's why we have a different um, countersink for, um, you know, we have an actual tool called a countersink. Um, And so, because that will actually give you the, the, the 90 degree um, countersink compared to a drill, which if you just use the, sometimes I'm lazy and I just use a big drill, but if you use a big drill, it's not quite the right angle. And so that's why the um, the, the countersunk, countersunk screws will stick up a little bit. Um, just to show that there are countersink screw, um, drills, uh, screws. So the idea, that's why we do this. And um, I guess it's counterboard as well. Anyway, okay, so if we don't want to have this um, hex nut, sorry, the, the top of the hex butt, hex bolt sticking out, what we can do is we can counterbore it and then that way it won't get damaged and you know, it won't get loosened, all these sorts of things. Um, we've talked about PCD as well. The idea is we rotate the interesting stuff in. Um, so even if it's not on the line of the section plane, so you see that thickened line is the section plane. Even if it's not in line, we move the interesting stuff in there. Okay, um, so let's go back to the paper. No, this is the paper. Oh yeah, so I just wanted to draw the attention to that. And feature four, yeah, is threaded. Okay, so we've got some copper. Let's see what my answer I wrote for this was. Okay, so I actually fully wrote out these answers. So. Why do we have, um, why do we care about the electrical conductivity of cop, um, ETP? So ETP, um, electrolytic tough pitch, is the default copper we use in electrical applications. Uh, why do we use it? Because it's very conductive. It's, we consider it to be, uh, so it's 99.9% .9 pure copper. We consider impurities of silver to be um, included in that because silver is the only other material that's more conductive than copper. Um, and it's a very good conductor. We can even get better than that. We can have OFHC, which is 99.99% um, pure, and it has excellent conductivity, even better conductivity. Um, why do we care about conductivity? Well, it makes it more efficient. So um, what did they say here? Yeah, look, I'm not gonna read their answers. You can read their answers. Um, I, so signal is sent as an electrical current and low resistance improves efficiency. That'll do for me. Um, Ductility allows the copper to be drawn into wire. Corrosion resistance reduces maintenance and repair. Probably repair more than maintenance, but a bit of both. Okay, outline how one innovation in aeronautical engineering has contributed to the performance of modern um, aircraft. Okay, so 
what did I write? Okay, I wrote for that. Um, okay, so I've cubed. So I've circled the word outline. We just talked about outline. Do you remember what it was? We just looked at it. Sketch in general terms. Um, outline. Sketch in general terms indicate the main features of. Okay, so. I've lost the. We'll go here. Okay, um, I do like having the paper, even if it's on the right page on there. Okay, so for me, so outline sketch in general features, um, main points of um, one innovation. So we're boxing that um, improved performance of modern aircraft. So we're underlining, we're stressing the important words. And then for E, I've just written little tots. So I've said um, winglets. And turbofan versus turboprop. I'll be honest, I saw those answers. Um, but winglets, real engineering talks about winglets are probably the most important thing in terms of there's no one um, innovation that was being as effective for um, improving efficiency than winglets. Turbovan versus turboprops, I think is another good one as well. But I just thought I'd talk about turbo um, turboprops with high bypass. Um, oh, high bi oh, wait. Oh, I've written the wrong thing. Um, so high, path, high bypass turbo fans is what I meant to write. Uh, well, now I feel twice like an idiot. High bypass turbo fans. The reason you don't have to. <clears throat> I mean, I'm not going to change it. That would be a waste of everyone's time. But you know, wrong. High bypass turbo fans. The reason why I thought that was interesting is because they actually told us that earlier. So why, is it, why do we use it? Because it improves fuel efficiency, including saving money and reducing greenhouse gases. And also it's quieter, which has a social benefit. Okay, so next we have described the use of different types of materials um, for the wings of aircraft over the last 100 years. So describe is, I have feet, um, features and properties. It's actually not that, it's something close to that though. So let's have a quick look at that. I don't intend on doing this every time. I did write it down a few times though. Um, describe is D, 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 describe. Provide characteristics and features. It's pretty close. Um, I wrote features, not properties. Okay, characteristics and features. Okay, and it's over 100 years. Okay, so it's, um, let's say we're cubing, so we a circle. The underline different types of materials. So, you know, not say, um, mechanical considerations, right? We're looking at material considerations, not manufacturing, right? We're looking at materials. We're looking at wings over the last hundred years. And this was a 2020 paper, so we're talking from 1920. So you don't want to be you don't want to be talking about the 1903 Wright Brothers aeroplane um, as an example. And that said, in 19, 1920, so 1920 was just after World War One. In World War One they were definitely still using um, wooden aircraft. So we can talk about the frames and the skin. So in the 1920s, aircraft still used timber frames that were easy to cut and join. So I was talking about timber being easy to cut and join. By World War II, I think there were some, some steel, um, steel frames. Uh, so Business Casual has a great thing on Boeing. I'm pretty sure he talks about steel, steel planes. But the bigger thing is aluminium. Um, aluminium frames were used, and I've written here AL preferred. Now, I'm gonna say this is a cautionary tale. Um, so where I've written AL, would you have read that as AL? No, you would have read that as A in, a in a bracket. And you would have thought, what is going on here? And just keep in mind that the marker is reading hundreds of these a day, right? They're gonna read a lot of these and the marker, they're not gonna try and overthink it. They're gonna say A, okay, just move on. They were used preferred due to its strength to weight ratio and corrosion resistance. Now, I guess the mark would probably say, well, aluminium is there, but what I meant to write was aluminium was preferred. Now, I spoke to a student, a good student. He um, you know, is in the top three. He, he came equal first in the last assessment task in year 11. Um, this is year 11 student. And I told him if he doesn't improve his handwriting, it's going to hurt his marks in, um, in next year. Not for me, because I, I will read it, but um, if the marker can't read what you're writing, it's going to have an impact. Okay, so... Strength to weight ratio and corrosion resistance. Today we use composites such as carbon fiber reinforced polymer due to its fatigue resistance. 
Um, Real Engineering has a video talking about why the Dreamliner of Windows is so big. And he basically talks about um, how planes, are, they expand and contract as the pressure changes. Um, this puts the plane, plane under a lot of um, fatigue. The point of failure is often the windows, the openings in the fuselage. And because of the properties of carbon fiber, we can afford to have bigger windows. Bigger windows improve passenger comfort and also they, they improve safety. So, okay, moving on. A periodic shift in maintenance is to be carried out. Okay, so identify the appropriate test that could be used to check the airworthiness of the landing gear. So we're back to this guy, and he's got a video that's clearly written for this paper, right? It doesn't actually talk about 2020, but it must have shown up somewhere in the Google Analytics because he talks about testing. I also have testing. Um, where would I, if you want to look at my notes on testing, at the moment I haven't put them in Google Classroom because I set this up in year 11, but boy do I have some stuff on my um, Sam Rockwell notes. Uh, do I want to zoom to zero? Okay, what have I got here? So. If we go to see more, I have eddy current tests, I have ultrasonic tests, I have thermo thermography, I have magnetic particle tests. Let's just have a look at two of them. Um, so the ultrasonic test, I mean, these are some pretty good videos. Um, I actually have a whole bunch of things open on my computer at school that I am ready to put into. So this test, we have the same person from Material Science 2000. We can see that the magnets, um, the magnetism causes the iron filings to show up at the crack, and then when we use UV light, boom, you can see it really clearly. Um, they do the same thing with eddy current testing, um, different person this time, but same company. Um, and then they have a dye penetration test. Well, let's go with this one, this one's pretty good. Um, I think they do a really good explanation. So they show that when we have a void in this sample, they have a sample that has a hole, and when we move the probe, this is the same thing that when you have, um, like the ultrasound used with a baby, it measures the time for the sound to be reflected back, and when there's a defect, it will, um, so the sample, I think, there we go, this is exactly what I wanted. So we can see that it's detected a difference in the time that it takes for it to bounce back. And we can see that spike here tells us that there is a defect. So um, the last one I'll show you is the dye penetration test, which I think is pretty good. Um, this is the pink dye. So what we do is we spray um, we, we spray the stuff with the pink stuff, then we wash it away. Then we go over it with, because otherwise it'd just be pink, right? Then we go over with the developer, we spray that developer on, and then the pink stuff, it the capillary action pulls the pink out into the um, developer and you can then see the crack is like 10 times bigger. Crazy, right? And we're gonna see, so here she is, she's um, made everything pink, washed it off, spraying on the developer, okay, spraying on the white developer and then, look at them cracks, right? So um, I just think that the, these videos really, I mean, before, when we talk about um, innovations, uh, telecommunication innovations before, I mean, I do generally think the internet was a mistake, but, um, you know, we can actually see these tests without having to drive, you know, an hour each way to go to a uni open day. Okay, so let's go down to an air gauge. This is a calculation. Um, now this question, we'll click on the notes for this. They've said, so we're using the hydrostatic pressure. Now I've said that there hasn't really been a hydrostatic pressure prior to this for years. Like I think we're talking 2010 or something like that. The old HSC, maybe 2008 um, for hydrostatic pressure questions. I don't think that most people, because when, it's not, I don't think it's a true hydrostatic pressure question because they're not talking about the density of water and the, the amount of um, head on top of it. So the, you know, the height of water over the top of it. What they're just saying is that um, we have a gauge of, um, of 750, plus we know the air pressure is 100, so we're adding those together to get 850, and that gives us our pressure. Um, air pressure is given in kilopascals. We don't want to ever work in kilopascals. 
if they give us millimeters, we go together like megapascals and millimeters squared, right? So because they've given us millimeters squared, we're gonna use megapascals. So we're gonna convert into megapascals. And um, I have told people, especially if you plan on doing engineering for like a career at uni, start to learn pi d squared on four. It'll, you know, I, I remember my teacher saying to me that, um, you know, use this and I just, I didn't listen to them. And it wasn't until I was like second year uni before I realized actually that always is just diameters and you're less likely to make a mistake if you're not changing things. Stress equals force over area. So this is pressure or stress, but you know, I like to use stress. Stress equals force over area. So that we can rewrite that as force equals area times stress. Boom, gives us our answer. Okay, we've got a bike. It says that, um, a couple of pages down. Um, bike, yes. This diagram shows two bicycles, one from the 1900s and one from 2020. Uh, the basic components of the bicycle have not changed over the last 120 years. We'll talk about two um, material technologies, or manufacturing and material technologies that have evolved significantly in this period. I'm gonna pause for a sec. So I've got this video here um, of a guy with a 19, um, with an 1880s bicycle, and um, he's competing against a professional cyclist who is riding on. So he's got a bike from 1890, say, and the other guy has got a bike from 1880. And he talks about, unfortunately, if, you can't watch the whole video anymore, but um, the difference in the bicycles in the course of these t 10 years is pretty enormous. And the three things he talks about is, so this bicycle was made only 10 years later, has tube steel, it has a chain, and it has uh, rubber tires or pneumatic tires. So vulcanized rubber tires. And we can see that if you watch the video, um, he beats the, the old bike um, is way worse and the new bike more than makes up for the fact that this guy is not actually all that fit compared to the professional cyclist. So, um, I've linked this and you can, I think, get the whole thing if you, you know, watch it through um, iView or whatever, but um, too much effort. So that's on 1880 bike versus 1888 bike. So what did I write in my notes? I wrote, compared to two technologies, um, I said, I've given you three, you can choose which one. So the tires, um, solid versus vulcanized rubber. Um, frame tube steel versus carbon fiber reinforced polymer and the drive um, direct pedal versus the chain. So um, yes, there's some, there's our differences. Um, okay, uh, a rider leans forward 55% of their mass, uh, turning moment, generating the moment of this. Now, this is a question that looks way more complicated than this. And I think that what you really gotta do is just come back and think of what are they looking for? Well, they're looking for mass. And so that what have they told us? They've told us moment, really writing down the information, right? Like I sometimes write data and then just write all the information really can help because like, so I've had students before who've looked at things and they're like, I don't know what to do. And it's like, they gave you an area, they gave you a force, they probably want you to calculate the stress. You know, it's, I mean, it's not, there's only so many questions they can ask you. So um, let's have a look at what we what I did. Okay, so I've written a note here. I've just written 0.55 mg to let me remember that force is gonna be mg. It's gonna be the weight due to gravity. And what we're gonna say is when we're talking about force moments, we're always interested in perpendicular distances. They've told us it's a moment about this axle and we've got perpendicular distance. So the perpendicular distance, I'm gonna call that as D. Now I've just drawn a little triangle here. I've done some trigonometry. We do a fair bit of trigonometry in this, um, in this test. And we're gonna say that because the angle is 20 degrees and we're finding the opposite, well, we're gonna say D equals 740 sine 20. And then we just say moment equals force times distance. And let's have a look. So we've got force is 0.55 mg. The distance is 740 sine 20. And we're just gonna multiply the gravity. We're gonna use 10, not 9.8. And just remember we want to use meters because we go together like megapascals and millimeters squared. They haven't given us any other units. They've given this as Newton meters. So, I mean, they haven't given us megapascals. So we should convert everything into meters. 
The only time we really want to use megapascals or millimeters squared is when they've given us something that's in millimeters squared or millimeters power four, because we just don't want to convert millimeters squared. There's a real easy, it's very easy to get yourself in a trap if you do that. Okay, um, I use a bit of algebra and I get um, 94. Now I will say that um, when I first did this on the day of the, the test, I got 900 and I went back to uh, 9,400. 9, and what it was is I'd multiply by 10 instead of dividing by 10. Having a, just a thought of how many people weigh nine tons? Not many people. I don't know if the Hulk weighs nine tons, he might, but the average person weighs under 100 kilos. So, you know, it's probably a reasonable assumption that the, this uh, bike rider is going to be under 100 kilos. Okay, so we've um, got resistance of gravity. Okay, so we've got. Now, I thought this was interesting. They, give, they wrote answer, but they didn't write how much power. What's the unit for power? Ah, what? That's it. Gotcha. Yep. Who's on first? What's on second? I don't know who's on third. Um, so, anyway, um, so here we go. Power equals FE. Fight the power FE, right? Public enemy, flavor, flav. And another way of writing that is um, power equals force, velocity is um, distance over time. So I looked at this question, I can see a distance and I can see a time. So I've written it as force equals 500 newtons, that was given. Velocity equals 20 divided by five, which is four. Pretty easy, easy two marks there. Anyway, just there's no unit given. So you had to know that um, the unit for power is watts. Okay, and then we've got um, explain how the dynamo generates power to turn the bicycle light on. Um, we had a question on this recently, I think maybe the 2019 paper had one about pedaling a radio and um, just worth, so what have I written? Okay, so I've, I've cubed it, so I've done circle, uh, so explain how and why, most people get that. Um, we're generating power, we're going to move, so I've written my, my little, my little you know, thing to remember that, which is movement plus magnets equal electricity. So. Um, that's far from the right answer, and I've given detailed answers on um, motors and what what answer you should give. I have given that specifically. I'm not going to find that for you now, but um, I mean, there's HSE answers. So let's see what those people said. Um, they said, as a bicycle wheel rotates, it's connected to the spins and armature, magnetic field, stationary magnets causing. Um, a casing the generator, this results in generation of electricity. Why is it connected to the dynamo let light to be lit? Yep, okay. Um, I wouldn't necessarily go for that specific kind of answer, but you know, it's not one, it's not, it could be worse. Okay, so we've got concrete pad. Now I had the chance to talk to some HSC markers about this question. So it says, describe why concrete would have been used in this situation. So let's have a look at what I've written. I have said, um, okay, describe it's actually not features and properties, characteristics and properties, but you know, close enough. Uh, characteristics and features. And we said why concrete would be um, selected for this situation. Now, we don't know that it's reinforced. It could be bulk concrete, but realistically, it's probably going to be reinforced. Um, and what are some of the things that they've said? Well, we've said um, concrete has compressive strength. It can have a Rio, which provides the tensile strength. It has resistances. Re resistance to, it's resistant to abrasion. It's not going to wear away from the rain. It's... Um, it's not going to rust. It's not going to get eaten by termites. Um, and it can be cast on site, which is very economical. You don't have to carry it around in a big truck. Although, if you wanted to, you could carry it around in a big truck um, because we can precast concrete. So, especially if we want it to be uniform and uh, we want a really high surface finish or some sort of detail, we could actually precast it and bring it on site. Okay. Um, step by step description. So, I mean, that's the kind of, I guess, provide is actually the key word, but you know, description um, of how we're going to make this thing. So, I would say that we would punch it um, under, so we're effectively um, applying a lot of force and we're going to shear, shear the opening and then we're going to bend that opening. That's what I would say. There are other ways that we could cut the, um, cut the opening. We could use laser cutters. I think I saw that laser cutters can cut up to like 16 millimeters. Uh, we can use water jets and we could use like CNC routers. Um, we wouldn't, but we could theoretically. 
Um, you know, I had a chance to talk to a uh, cabinet maker and he had strong opinions about the manufacturing because, again, that's what he does, uh, what he used to do anyway before he became a teacher. Um, okay, so we've got here, the diameter of the pin and the turnbuckle, turnbuckle is 40 millimeters and the stress across the pin is um, 55. Find the magnitude. Of, so this is just a classic um, bolt shear question. So we're going. Is it in single, triple, double? How many times is this axle being uh, cut in the tug of war that's going on? So let's look. At, I just like to start at the top of the 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 thing. Yep. And we're going to say, well, this one's going. We're going to call this to the left. We're going to call this. We'll call this down. We'll call that up. All right. No dispute. So this is going. This is being pulled down, 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 down. This is being pulled up, 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 down, down, down. So there are two changes in direction. So there's two cutting planes, two shear planes. So if it's two shear planes, um, we're going to double the area. So let's. I mean, that's their formula, but you know. I went to the effort of writing the formula. I might as well show you how I write it. So double area, so I said the area equals times twice the pin, two pi four e squared on four equals um, 25, 12. And then I don't like that we're doing this twice in the same question that they're, you know, I, I don't like, I feel as though they're, they're testing us twice on the same content, but you know, if you know it, lucky, if you don't, unlucky. Okay, so the next thing we're do, gonna do is gonna draw this and it's three marks and I would just say that um, you can sometimes see samples of student drawings and I can tell you that what gets one mark is pretty mediocre and what gets three marks can still have a lot to be desired. So especially when they give you a sample, like they give you a starting point, they've already given you this, um, this nut. They've shown break lines here. You might not realize they're break lines. I'll just quit. Okay, so we've got some um, the Australian standard on break lines. Um, uh, I mean, is their break line you know meeting that break line? I, I guess I would have done shown break lines like this, but you know, who am I? When I've written a HSC paper, then I can talk. Um, anyway, we'll go back to the question. So what did I draw as my answer? Um, well, we'll have a look at their answer and we'll have a look at my answer. So a couple of dif differences. So the first thing is I really like that there's a center line shown in the sample answer. Um, I can say, having talk, spoken to markers, that there were not many people who necessarily show, show um, added their own center lines into these drawings. Um, you need to show the thread. Um, you need So effectively, you're looking at three different parts. I mean, I don't want to say it's the, the, this is exactly how it goes, but we've got one mark for drawing this radius and this circle, one mark for showing this um, this loop of the, the turnbuckle thing here, and then another mark for correctly doing the thread. That's pretty much it, and that, that's pretty easy. Um, I tried to be a little bit more exact, and you know, this is what I did. Now, obviously it says, do not show hidden detail, do, do not show dimensions. Oh, I was gonna rub that one out, I didn't. Anyway. Um, Okay, so what have I got? Um, I figured out how far this thing goes back. So it says that it goes back 65 millimeters. It's at a scale of one to two, so that means it's half, right? Imagine those little circles as the divide symbol. So it's half the size. So we're going back 65 millimeters, so I'm drawing 32.5 millimeters. And then from that point, this thing is a radius of 70. So presumably that means that we're gonna see that curve there. Um, then I actually found out how far is it from the center of this point, from the center of our, um, I guess we're gonna call this our threaded bolt, um, our threaded eyelet, a threaded pin, that's what we're gonna call it. From the thread, the center of the threaded pin back is 82 mil, so it's 41. And then I drew the thread. Now, I have noticed recently that in recent papers they have shown um, in their answers, the thread, they often show it at this little 45 degree line here where it terminates, 45 degrees there. Um, because it's so fine, the, the, the thread's so fine, it's not, not very clear, not easy to see. Um, but you see Copeland, you can see in his notes, he doesn't show that 45 degrees, but I do notice that it's very common in the papers recently. Um, and if we look at the Australian Standard, um, 
so here's what I was talked about before about the female connection, right, is, is shown as being in X, uh, um, with the hatching. I just want to show bolts in the Australian standard. That's nuts. Bolts. Yeah, you see, they don't necessarily show the 45 degree. They show it here. I mean, I was going to get a friend of mine to get me a better copy of this. You can see the 45 degree there or there. So you can do either. They're both acceptable. Um, I've just been showing it recently because the HSC has been showing it recently. So, But they didn't show it in 2020. So, you know, what do I know? Um, they did have it in 2021 and they did have it in 2019. So, okay. Um, now, you'll notice I drew my thread a little bit um, coarse, right? It's a little bit deeper. I just wanted to make it really clear what was going on. But I did calculate because it's fine. And so I, I did this with my U10s today. And I said, okay, is it fine or coarse? And we know that it's fine because we can see the X. The X means it's extra fine. So this is the, the D major, which is this dimension. And um, this is the pitch. The D min is the major diameter minus the pitch. So 30 minus 3.5 is 2.6 divided by that. It's actually three and a quarter, but three and a quarter rounds down. So 13 and a quarter. So this is 13 is that distance there. Um, then over here, we can actually see it's tapered. So it's 32 and 30. So that means that we should actually see a difference between, um, oh, here we go. This is 32 and this is 30. At this point, we should actually see a one millimeter gap between the um, this pin and the opening, the hole that's been drilled. But I wouldn't lose sleep over that. Um, you can see that I've just freehanded my drawing, my circles. You won't lose a mark for that. Um, if you have a compass and you think it's going to look nicer and you can do, use your compass. I actually had a compass in my hand while I was doing this and I still didn't do it. So, um, you know, it's just not necessary. Uh, once upon a time, it was absolutely necessary. Not anymore. Okay, so let's keep going. And um, back to the paper. Okay. Describe the potential legal and ethical implications um, of not fault, not doing ongoing tra training. That's an interesting question. Um, good one I could put in my notes somewhere, but let's have a look at what I wrote. I wrote some stuff. Okay, if you don't do ongoing training, your skills might not be up to date. If you're not up to date, you might not be using best practice. You are expected, so Engineers Australia, they have a standard of ethics and they say you are expected to work within your field of competence. And if you're not maintaining your skills, you're no longer working within your field of competence. Therefore, you're breaching the Australian uh, Engineers Australia's field of um, uh, code of uh, code of ethics. Um, now, specifically, ethically, if you don't, why is that an issue? Well, if you're um, not, if you are not up to date, you won't be meeting the needs of stakeholders because there might be a new technology, there might be a new um, guideline, and you're not aware of that, and it means that you might be providing a substandard product or a product that is, you know, we could be using a better material or better better manufacturing method and we're not using it. So, you know, we're disadvantaging our stakeholders. Legally, um, you can be sued if you don't meet the standards. So if the standards change and you don't, you know, if you're not up to date on that, well, you know, you could be sued. And if someone is injured, you could actually be arrested for, and charged with negligence. It's very rare that, um, I mean, we like to threaten that that happens, but it doesn't really happen. Um, it's incredibly rare that people actually get charged with um i mean sued not rare going to jail i it's incredibly rare um i mean I, I went looking for cases and i couldn't really find them not in australia um that said i've known people who have been sued um because their designs were they were involved with a fatality anyway so moving on um Okay, we've got a uh, rivet and it says here describe. So we said describe is um, characteristics and features and describe the hot working processes of riveting. Okay, Re and show the resulting structure, include labeling. Now I did not include labeling, right? Boom, I lost a mark, right? You need a label. I will say I did this paper in about an hour, so you know, uh, I didn't write all the extended answers, so I'm not giving myself too big a pat on the back, but I'm also not going to make myself feel too bad that I left out a couple of things. Um, so hot working means, and that's not a greater than symbol, that's an arrow. 
hot working means it's above the recrystallization temperature. So we saw in a paper, I think the 2019 paper, it talked about lead at, z lead at room temperature is already above the recrystallization temperature. We said that recrystallization in steel, I looked up, you know, uh, when I did the 2019 paper, it indicated it was much lower than I would have thought. I would have thought it was above the upper, cri lower critical temperature, but hey, what do I know? I'm not a metallurgist, so. Um, grain flow is the idea that these grains will flow around the object. So that's what we're looking at there. So we've, we've seen these sorts of things before. Um, we should know that forging and riveting is a process of forging is gonna create um, grain flowing. Okay, let's move on. Trusses, right? We should always anticipate a truss in the paper. Certainly we should be anticipating a reaction question. So I've got my reaction calculation here. Um, you'll notice I went from being using pen, uh, pen to pencil. Um, it's a whole lot easier to make a correction if you've used pencil. Um, the alternative point of view is if you write in pen, you don't want to scribble out things because the markers will try really hard to write, find anything that you've written. But once you've scribbled things out, we can't really give you marks for it anymore. Okay, so we get the reaction. At this point, you should be able to find reactions. If you don't know how to get reactions, what can I, um, what links do I have to help you? We're done with that. We're done with that. We might still use that. Okay, we've got Eureka Engineering. And um, Eureka Engineering, he wrote um, the textbook, which I recommend. Um, if you don't have enough questions, you know, mathematic questions in your life, well, go and check out Eureka Engineering. And he goes through fully worked solution. I also have my fully worked solution. Um, I did have it open earlier, but uh, hey, you know, check out my playlist. I'm sure you'll be able to find it. Um, look up pasts. Uh, yeah, you'll find it. Um, so how are we going about this? So we've got the, the reactions. Um, and then once we've got the reactions, we're gonna make a cut. Uh, we're gonna, I like to label the Whenever we cut, we should never have more than three members being cut. So if we're always looking for one, we're looking for C, I'm gonna name, if they're not named already, I like to name them P and Q because you're never getting P and Q mixed up with things. That's my, my theory, right? And um, so P and Q, I look and I say, well, are P and Q, do P and Q meet? They don't meet. Therefore, we're gonna use the sum of the forces vertically. We're gonna use what I call the lone wolf, right? If P and Q don't meet, we're gonna use lone wolf. And that means we're gonna say, what does C do that the others don't. And we can see it has vertical component. The others don't have vertical component. If they don't meet and C doesn't do something that the others don't, well, then you're gonna have a problem, right? You need to think about it. You maybe have to use um, method of joints and come around, you have to break it up and do something, you know, do it in two parts. But um, at the HSC level, every question that we're gonna get is usually going, I mean, I can't think, I mean, I've gone through every every truss that has been in the last 20 years. There's not, not been any that have not been solvable using either the lone wolf or the meetup. Anyway, we're not gonna go into too much more detail here. We're gonna say that um, it's the meetup method. So what we do is we find the um, sum of the for vertical forces. The sum of the vertical forces equal, um, I got 5.4 and then, um, if that's the ver vertical component of C is 5.4, well, we know C has to be bigger because it's a hypotenuse. How much bigger? Well, we divide by the disco number and that gets us um, 6.23. Um, if that was too fast, you need to go and watch this video here where he'll explain it over seven minutes. I don't want to spend seven minutes talking about it. Okay, so we've got to describe the methods used to protect civil structures against corrosion. Support your answer with examples. So you'll notice that I've got S's there to say that we need to have two methods at least and two examples at least to um, to really be accessing those full marks. We've got describe, which we've said describe is properties and features. No, it's characteristics and features. Okay, so I've got three here that I like. ICP um, is used in pipe pipelines, so that's um, if you just write ICCP, they'll give it to you. If you said cathodic protection or impressed current cathodic protection is the full answer. That's used on pipelines. The idea is that when um, when it loses electrons due to corrosion, um, it will be those uh, those missing electrons will be replaced by providing electric current. Galvanizing is a coating. Um, it's used on all sorts of things. It's used on like light poles and gantries. 
Um, so gantries are the so, So um, gantries are the things that go over the trains. So something like that. Um, if it stands up, if it goes from both side to side, it's a gantry. Otherwise, it's a staunchion, which we saw. Um, staunchion. Um, staunchions. It doesn't have rail. There we go. So staunching is if it's a single side, if it's double, it's a gantry. Um, now, the HSC answer specifically says that we could apply sacrificial anodes to those. Hey, you know, maybe that's true. Um, but I tend to associate sacrificial anodes with boats. And I say that as someone who has, you know, inspected and um, overseen the installation of staunchions and gantries. So, you know, what do I know? Um, lastly, paint, right? So in the example, they talk about Sydney Harbour Bridge um, is painted and it provides a sufficient um, protection. Okay, so moving on to... Uh, yeah, outline the benefits of di digital transmission. Okay, a couple of answers we can give here. We can say, so outline says um, general terms, main features, and we're talking about digital signal transmission. So what have I got here? I've said, well, digital, um, digital is a lot easier to store. Uh, it usually has better quality. When I say better quality, uh, digital technologies are all or nothing. You either get the signal or you don't. There's no, um, back in the days of analog TV, you might get, like a snowy picture where you don't get great picture but you get something and you can kind of make out the football game whereas with digital you either get the picture or you don't get it at all um, you don't need as many repeaters for digital signal typically um, especially if you're going over um, optical fiber you don't have as much attenuation as you do with an analog signal you can generally send more bandwidth and um, if we're sending things over, say, optical fiber, we have security. So they're things worth um, mentioning. Um, you can look at their answer. Their answer is, is fine. Discuss the methods, methods for increasing signal strength um, of a receiving antenna. Now, I felt this was a hard question. Um, I haven't looked recently. I haven't talked about what people have done well in what they haven't recently. Um, What's this one? 26D, 26C. Yeah, I mean, I would have thought this would have been answered terribly. But um, the thing you've got to remember is the HSC markers do have some leniency that as long as you've made an attempt, well, they're going to give you one, one mark, right? So if you say, um, make sure that the antenna is not blocked by trees, right? Um, that would be straight away i'll give you one mark for that i'll maybe even give you two um so when it says discuss so it says issues providing um so consider issues and provide um, arguments for and against now i always like to talk about how in french there is no word for issue issue means exit so whenever you want to talk about the concept of issues you instead have to think about is it a question or is it a problem so you want to think, well, okay, are there any questions which come into um, how we're going to um, improve the signal strength of receiving antenna? Well, yeah, okay, so there's a question of, you know, so safe levels of radiation. Um, what are the problems? Well, okay, we have things like cost. Um, so what, what are our options? Well, we can boost the signal. Um, we can ask the person transmitting the signal, say, hey, can you put some more energy into it? We can reduce interference, so even things like trees or um, other sig you know, other signals that interfere with it. So if someone else is sending a different signal, they can interfere. Um, we also want, we can adjust the length of the antenna. So that's a, a consideration. And also the direction of the antenna. They're the answers I would give. Um, it says methods, so you notice the box around the S there, they've said methods, so we should give, give two at least. I would say in this case, if as long as you've named two things, if you said um, boost the signal and you know chop down the trees in the way, I'd probably be looking at a pretty reasonable, pretty favorable answer there. 
I think it's a hard question. It's worth, um, it's, you know, this is why we do these practice papers. Um, okay. So here we have a picture with an armature. We've got a DC motor and we've got a whole bunch of resistors and we've got some switches. Those resistors will not be connected unless we close the switch. So, which I've labeled by saying open equals less resistance equals less current. Now I've also circled back EMF. I'm going to come back to that. So first of all, we're going to say we have, if we cube this, we've got explain, which is how and why they've said specifically, they want to know how we can con control the motor. So the idea is that um, as we close each switch, we will increase the resistance to the current, which will reduce uh, um, to the motor, reducing the current and reducing the current will reduce the speed of the motor, right? So we can have four power settings with um, all four being open, being the fastest, all four being closed, being the slowest. Why would we do this? Now, this is, the question didn't ask this, but um, a few years ago, I ate a hat. I've eaten two hats so far. I've got a hat currently on the line that will, I'll have to pay off next year if I lose. Um, but I challenged my class. I said I would eat a hat if someone could find a question that asked about back EMF. And someone found a question from the old HSE 2008, which, you know, I mean, I could say that was an old syllabus, but I felt as though I wasn't sporting, so I ate the hat. Um, and so whenever I talk about back, I, I now, my students have been very well, very much um, well versed in the idea of back EMF. Um, so the idea is we watch a video and it talks about how DC motors will actually produce some amount of negative voltage. So if we're running this DC motor off a 12 volt battery, it'll actually only be running off 11 volts because the motor itself produces one volt backwards. Now this isn't a huge problem. I mean, it's an issue of efficiency, but the problem is that um, when you turn on the, the motor, you, the back, there's no back VMAF yet. You're not, getting, you're not getting that one volt negative. So when you hit apply the full 12 volts, um, you could actually destroy the motor or you can certainly damage the motor. So that's why we need to have some sort of speed regulation so that it's slowly, we don't increase the, um, the voltage until we get the speed up. So that we, uh, the question's not asking that. I just think, um, I, I would not expect any student to give that answer, but you know, I had a hat. So now I am really focused on um, EMF questions, back EMF questions. Um, remember, EMF stands for electromotive force, and electromotive force is measured in volts. Explain why we use the Australian standard. Um, so I've got three main ideas. Explain is a how or why. Um, it's two marks. So we use the Australian standard because it's consistent, which means that everyone uses the same standard. Um, this has the benefit of being unambiguous, so everyone everyone knows what things mean. It's also clear, so it's actually efficient because um, everyone can read it. You get used to reading it. It becomes things go. It, um, it gets to the point where people understand the shorthand, and we'll have a look at a question in a second where that'll point that out. And then lastly, and this is probably the most important, is by having a um, clear standard, we have accountability. When something goes wrong, we know who has to pay. Okay. So lastly, we're going to have this question here and we've been asked to draw a pictorial drawing. Now, prior to this, there had not been a pictorial drawing in like well over five, five years. And I kept thinking, do we need, yes, yeah, good. Um, I kept thinking, do I need to spend time and effort teaching kids how to draw um, pictorial drawings when they're just not in the paper? And I actually posted that into the engineering studies teacher group and what well, do you know, the next year there was a pictorial drawing. Um, and you know, I wasn't sure how I felt about that because they are a lot of work. But just quickly referring to the Australian standard, I mean, by having this broken circle that we mentioned earlier, it means that that's threaded. Yeah, it means that there's a thread on the outside there. Now, I don't think you would have lost a mark for not drawing the thread, but I don't know, I, I didn't mark this. I think that, um, what, what'd they give? 26, 27B, um, for all of 27, they gave eight marks. That says out of eight marks. Yeah, I don't actually have the individual, I think it was on another piece of paper, which I lost. Um,
No. Anyway, don't care. Um, yeah, it, it just by having a agreed um, standard, it makes life easier. It uh, means we can look at things like M, um, M8 times 1 and we know exactly what they're talking about. Um, okay, so first we know that it's a scale of 2 to 1, which means it's going to be twice the size of the dimension shown. And let's have a look at my answer. Now, I did not use, I, again, I had a set square on my desk and I chose not to use it. Uh, well, I had a 45 degree set square, which I did use as a ruler, but I didn't bother getting out a 30 degree um, set square. I might have, but I wanted to try and show what, you know, what a reasonable drawing might look like. And I don't think I spent more than 10 minutes. I'm, I'm, as a matter of fact, I'm confident I did not spend more than 10 minutes on this drawing. Now, you'll notice that I did show the back of the hex and the back of this circle, which I shouldn't have. But you notice that they're much lighter lines, which tells the marker that they're construction lines. And as long as they can see a difference between light and dark lines, they can tell what I intend. So I actually went over everything again. So you can see the light line, my construction line, and then my finished line. Um, so what can we see? So I started off by drawing this with a crow's foot. So I drew a horizontal line, a vertical line, and two more or less 30 degree lines. I then measured out this distance of 28. I went up 28 and I went across 50. I then just, um, I slid my, my ruler parallel. I'm pretty good at doing that. I'm pretty good at sliding my ruler parallel. All right, that's a learnt skill. Um, the more you do it, the better you get at it. Um, I kind of just sort of eyeball and I know what it looks like. I then drew the hexagon on the top. And so I started by drawing the two sides and then just drew the hexagon out. And then I drew another hexagon on top. I just drew up, 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 and then I drew the other hexagon on top. And it doesn't even look, really look like, you can see a little bit of the old hexagon, but it's because I drew lightly, um, you can only see it as construction lines. I then just drew a circle. Um, I just freehand that. Again, um, the more the more freehand um, isometric drawings you, you do, the better you get at this. I Just to show the thread, I, I don't really know, because we don't draw a lot of um, pictorial threaded stuff. I'm not sure how to draw it. So I just indicated that I knew that it was supposed to be threaded. Like I said, I don't think you lose a mark either way. Um, I probably spent more time on drawing this switch than I needed to. I also probably spent more time figuring out where this pin was than I needed to. But I did it. So what I did is I um, figured out, and I spent some time looking at, so this is three millimeters back, so it's six at our scale, and it's three millimeters or six across. Then it's down um, five or 10 millimeters to scale, and then across um, seven minus three is four. So it's down, um, I actually drew it as 10 by eight, right? But it's actually five by four. And I figured you'd probably see a bit of circle. So I just drew a little bit of the circle down the bottom. And that is all of the 2020 paper. Um, this is pretty long. Oh no, I got it all done an hour and 30 minutes anyway. I mean, I did a lot of preparation for this one. So hopefully it was worthwhile. Um, I think there's some interesting questions there and um, yeah. I hope. See you next time.